Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. What he didn't assume, he didn't heal. And boy, if there were ever something in us that needs some healing, it's our will, our wanter. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily, verse-by-verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the Gospel of John. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. As we learned last time, Jesus' words in John 5, 29 do not contradict the promise of John 3, 16. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. They clarify that any genuine belief in Christ bears fruits of love. Our Reformation fathers like to express it with this simple saying, Faith alone justifies, but the faith that justifies is never alone. It is always accompanied by good works. In today's reading, Jesus speaks more about judgment, but even more so about the witnesses he has to prove that he is who he says he is. John chapter 5, starting at verse 30. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me. And I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. John 5, verses 30 to 36. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, Since you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you've given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ready to dig in? Here we go. Verse 30, I can do nothing on my own as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I can do nothing on my own or more literally of mine own self, as the King James put it. St. Cyril, Bishop of Alexandria in the late fourth century, heard in this the doctrine of perichoresis, of interpenetration that the Father and the Spirit are in the Son, and the Son in the Father and in the Holy Spirit. And so I can do nothing of my own because whatever Jesus does is a shared operation involving in some way both the Father and the Spirit. From his incarnation to his death on the cross, the whole Trinity is involved in accomplishing our salvation and concurring with all the actions of the eternal Word made flesh. St. Augustine, another North African, late 4th and early 5th century, he stressed that the eternal Son is not of his own self, but of the Father, else he wouldn't be a son at all. Now, of course, the Father is indeed of his own self. Either way, the verse is dripping rich in implications for adoring the mystery of the Holy Trinity. Never forget the great saying of Philip Melanchthon, 16th century reformer, the mysteries of God are to be adored, not investigated. Loki Communis, 1st edition, 1521. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Hear whom or what? Does he intend the Father, who has committed all judgment to the Son, or does he imply here, the omniscience, which is surely communicated even to his human nature, and which he will use unbridled at the judgment, so that 
what his judgment will indeed be is righteous and fair and upright. He, who knows not just what we say, but even what we utter in the secrets of our hearts, he knows he's the judge. And this is why he says his judgment is just. Not just that he knows, but that he seeks not his own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, John the Evangelist does not portray the prayer in the garden, not my will, but thine be done. But surely the whole of his gospel bears witness to this from the Psalms, as it is written of me in the volume of the book, I have come to do thy will, O God. Now, pardon one more detour into later church controversies, but he can speak this way because in him, in Jesus, there are two natural wills. There is the divine will of the Logos, and there is the human will of the human nature. And when he speaks of not doing my own will, that's not Logos will, that's the human will. He came to do the will of his Father, which is identical with the will of the Logos and of the Holy Spirit. Mind-blowing, I know, but important to note. As St. Gregory of Nazianz has taught, what he didn't assume, he didn't heal. And boy, if there were ever something in us that needs some healing, it's our will, our wanter. So our Jesus conforms his human will to the divine will, which is exactly where a human will should reside. Your wish is my command. Verse 31. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that his testimony that he bears about me is true. What a vital thing to get hold of. Jesus knows that no human being is going to trust someone who says the wild and seemingly crazy and nonsensical things that he says without some sort of external backup to his claims It's even there in the law of Moses that to establish the veracity of a charge, you had to have at least two, preferably three witnesses. How much more to back up the claims Jesus is making in this chapter, that he has life in himself, that his voice will raise the dead, that he will sit in judgment over every single human life that has ever been lived, and that his judgment is going to be just and fair. You think about it for a second. If you heard someone making claims like that, You would think they were akin to the loony who knows that they're a boiled egg or Cleopatra reincarnate. So, even though Jesus knows that his testimony about himself is true, he rejoices that there is another who bears witness about him. And Jesus knows that this one's witness is God's truth. He's thinking first off, though not exclusively, of his cousin, St. John the Baptist. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. John bears witness to the truth. Think of all the things you've heard from St. John the Baptist's lips in this gospel. He's the Lamb of God. I'm not worthy to undo his sandal. He's preferred before me because he was before me. He's the bridegroom. He's from above. He's from heaven and above all. He's the giver of the Spirit on whom the Spirit descended, and that without measure. He's the beloved Son of his Father. He's the giver of eternal life to all who believe in him. And Jesus can say that this testimony that John bears is not from man. I think that's driving at the same point Jesus made when he told Peter in Matthew 16, after Peter confessed him to be the son of the living God, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my father, which is in heaven. So John held forth for others the enlightenment, which he himself had received from God. And in that way, he was this burning and shining light. And you, you all, you were willing to rejoice for a while, for a season in this light. Remember, for all the people held John to be a prophet indeed. And the light that was in John was virtually a spotlight directed squarely at Jesus. But Jesus goes on. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. 
for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. This is something of a parallel text to the message Jesus sends back to John when John is in prison and sends his disciples to ask if Jesus is the Christ or do they look for another. Now, All the church fathers and the fathers of the Reformation, they're all in 100% agreement that John is not being plagued by doubts. He's being plagued by disciples who won't go to the one he has been pointing them to. So he sends them to Jesus with a question so that they might witness the answer back to him. And how does Jesus answer John? Go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended at me. The works that I do. Even the Talmud bears a negative witness to Jesus' works. They ascribe them to witchcraft or the devil, as we hear in the Gospels, but that he did works that no one else could do and that no mere human being could ever pull off, that's the witness of his Father, that he is the one sent by the Father for whom they've been longing and waiting. In this Gospel, up to this point, you've only had detailed three of those works, Jesus turning water into wine at Cana, Jesus, also at Cana, healing the nobleman's son with the power of his word from a significant distance. Significant to us, distance seems to be no problem to him. He's healed a man left paralyzed for some 38 years. And then there are the little glimpses of his ability to read hearts and minds, knowing who Peter was and naming him anew, knowing about Nathaniel, knowing the whole story of St. Fodini at the Sychar Well. Each one testifies of him that he is the father's son the one sent into the world to be its savior. And so sent as the co-equal son with the father, he demonstrates that he has the authority to give life, to raise the dead, to render just judgment on the last day. And so the church delights to sing to him in her greatest hymn, the Te Deum Laudamus. You are the King of glory, O Christ. You are the everlasting Son of the Father. When you took upon yourself to deliver man, you did not spurn the virgin's womb. When you had overcome the sharpness of death, you opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You sit at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that you will come and be our judge. Till next time, people loved by God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. For any size gift by the end of 2019, we'll send you an autographed copy of Pastor Whedon's devotional book, Celebrating the Saints. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.